All right, uh, I think we're gonna get underway. We're having a number of folks here have just joined us in about the last uh, minute or so. So uh, this is Steve Deck. I'm the executive director here at Tri-County Regional Planning. Really appreciate everybody joining us for this. This is our, I think, last of our 2021 series of Tri-County Lunch and Learns uh, that we've been doing. We had four of them here in the, over the past several months. and. This one actually features uh, many of the staff here at Tri-County, so we especially appreciate that, although we thank all our sponsors for making this series um, possible. We did get approval for one AICP CM credit, uh, so either during this session or afterwards, um, Larry Portsline from our office will probably uh, email everyone with a link to an online survey, some questions you have to answer if you're gonna log your um, CM credit. So look for that if that's something you're on, interested in. And uh, also I'll just say logistically, please, please stay muted uh, during the session. If you wanna pose a question while you think about it, use the chat feature um, during the session. Uh, otherwise at the end, we will offer to open up for mics for everyone um, so that you can ask anything or make any comments that you care to offer. And we're also gonna record this session. You probably heard that note at the beginning. Um, and once it's, once it's done and we clean it up a little bit, we will uh, post that online for those. If you have a coworker or someone that you think would benefit for this, you can obviously share that uh, link to the recorded session after the fact. So, with that, I'm just gonna kind of kick things off here and, and turn it over to other staff members. Um, the subject for today is the Tri-Counties Planning Toolkit. Um, the planning Toolkit really isn't something new. Um, uh, as you can see here on the, on the screen right now, I have up the toolkit as it currently exists. So, as I just kind of slowly scroll down through it, you'll see we have had roughly speaking 20 subjects that we've tried to provide some good guidance on uh, over the past several years. It's just uh, thanks to DCED, um, we were able to get a grant this year to update um, the planning toolkit in terms of the topics and the guidance that's provided. So we really appreciate um, that opportunity um, from them. And that's what we're gonna do today is walk you through the new toolkit. The new toolkit uh, that you'll see here in a minute um, is kind of kind of arose out of some sessions we did about a year ago um, where we sought uh, uh, input from the PA Planning Association and here locally, what subjects do you, you know, are you facing? What challenges are you facing? What things might you want some good guidance on? And we use that to generate the new toolkit. Um, so uh, with, with basically just saying that, I'm gonna turn you over uh, now to, to uh, Lauren uh, here in our office. She's gonna, she's the one that was kind of behind setting this up, uh, this part of the website. So if you get on today, you'll see the old version. You get on probably a couple of months from now, this is what you'll see. So with that, I'm gonna let Lauren walk you through it. Thank you, Steve. So, um, yep, my name is Lauren Weaver. I'm a planner at uh, Tri-County Regional Planning Commission. So we, like Steve said, we're updating our toolkit and we decided to go with a kind of a new platform for this toolkit. Um, this is used uh, through the Esri uh, Experience Builder platform. And we decided to use this because it's just a little bit more interactive, um, very user-friendly, um, just has a nicer layout overall. So I'm just gonna walk you through what we put together, um, how you can find all of the toolkit fact sheets and everything. So um, you'll get to the screen, the planning toolkit, and then you'll just scroll down um, and you can see all of the um, planning topics um, listed by the categories So we have the environmental subdivision and miscellaneous topics, transportation topics, and zoning topics. So um, before we move on to the topics, 
Um, we do have this link at the bottom. So we are always looking for um, new input for the toolkit. So if you just click on that, it'll take you to a screen. Up, oh, I guess not, maybe. Uh, sometimes it does not connect always. Okay. Um, well, so <laughs> hopefully, user error. Um, hopefully, it will say um, it will take you to a survey. Um, oh crap! I just got. Uh, I just got out of it. We're sorry. Oh. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay. <laughs> um, so that should work. Um, I'll flip into technical details. Um, yeah. It sometimes it works on some screens, and sometimes it doesn't work on other screens. So we'll get that working. Um, that will be a just a quick survey there. Um, that'll let you um, type in any comments you have for the toolkit, any um, updates that you wish to see, or any topics that you wish to see. Um, so when you click on um, anywhere in this box with environmental topics, for um, example, it'll come up with um, all of the different topics that we have. And then um, uh, you can click on one, so we can just go to one here. And it'll pop up in a different window here, so you can just um, in a new tab. So then this is just an example of one of our uh, fact sheets, and we'll be going through some of them um, in more detail in just a few minutes. So it is very user friendly. Um, you don't have to go back to the home page every single time. You can scroll down at the bottom and then you can click on um, each of the different topics here. So you can scroll down. And then you can go back to the title page if you want there. So pretty user friendly. And of course, we're going to be up updating this um, as we go along. And we'll be adding in um, our subdivision and ordinance, model ordinance information that we'll be going over in a few minutes here. Um, so we'll be updating that. And um, so it's a work in progress still, but it should be up and running in a few months, like Steve said. So I'm going to hand it over to Alexa Korber. She's another planner, and she's going to go over some of the tools. Thank you, Alexa. Um, Hi there, everyone. Uh, like Lauren said, my name is Alexa Korber. I am also a planner at Tri-County Regional Planning Commission. Um, I'm going to take you through some of my research topics today, uh, the two vastly different topics of stormwater management and tiny homes. So let's see if our tech will cooperate with us here. Oh, right at the bottom, I think. There we go. Okay. So we're going to, this might take a couple of minutes here to load, everybody. <laughs> we, uh, we tried to get it all up. Uh, pre-done beforehand, but it uh, it's fighting against us here. So I guess I can start rambling on about it as we wait. Um, so obviously we all know that stormwater management is a big issue on everyone's minds these days. Um, okay, there we go, perfect. So I will keep talking, but yes, as I was saying, stormwater management, a big issue on everyone's mind these days, um, more rain events happening, more flooding, um, DEP coming at us with more water quality uh, requirements. We've got people talking about the MS4 program, people talking about combined sewers, people talking about the Chesapeake Bay, and there's just a bunch of stuff going on. Everything's very confusing. People are unsure of what to do and unsure of how to budget and everything like that. So some of my highlights through uh, researching effective stormwater management definitely come down to working a little bit more on a intermunicipal or full county area. So the way it was typically handled is uh, people do what they have to do. You know, they do a lot of little localized projects and things like that. Um, but a lot of my research sort of t uh, research sort of tends to some of these more countywide approaches. So you can see in a lot of our examples, we have Lancaster County that does a countywide stormwater management program. We have York that does the exact same thing. Uh, Clean Water Cumberland is actually Cumberland County's countywide action plan effort, uh, which is sort of the new, not a mandate, the new 
what word do I want to use for that fad kind of coming down from PADEP? Maybe, maybe I shouldn't use that word, but uh, people can yell at me for that one later. So um, as you can see, I won't talk a whole lot on this one because it is sort of a complicated issue, but I'll be around in the end for any, uh, any fact sheet or any questions here on the fact sheet or anything that I'm saying now. And I guess one of the takeaways I do want to give you with this is that we are going to recommend through our fact sheet and through our other, um, gosh, I cannot talk today. I'm super sorry, everybody. <laughs> and through our other outreach things, I guess, is that when people go for stormwater management, we want to recommend that they create a standalone stormwater management ordinance and not have it as part of their larger subdivision and land development ordinance. And that's all going to be because of ease of making changes. Um, when it's a standalone ordinance, it's going to be a lot easier for you to go through and make changes to it. So, so pivoting now severely, we are going to go into zoning issues, and I'm going to show you the tiny homes fact sheet. Okay. Okay. Yes, I will do that, Lauren. I'm super sorry. Oh, no, I'll do that next. That time. So tiny homes. Here we go. <laughs> And we're having a little, little bit of a slow to load here too. So again, I'll, I'll start talking a while. Um, what exactly is a tiny home? Uh, you'd think the name would kind of be self-evident. It is a tiny home. Uh, actually, there is no real definition towards it. Typically, they are dwelling units that are 600 square feet or less. Uh, they are typically mobile, either, either having wheels on them or having some kind of hitch that you can um, attach to a truck, you know, and, and, and take with you. But um, lots of different purposes. You can see all these pictures here actually came from the tiny estates in uh, Mount Joy Township in Lancaster County. And their little tiny home community is actually a campground. So the goal there would be you would come in and you would rent one of these units, you know, and ha have a little vacation. But uh, people are using these as primary dwelling units in some cases. Um, a lot of people do it sort of as a lifestyle thing. Uh, they want to minimize, downsize environmental impact. It is definitely cheaper than some more traditional housing options. Uh, but like I said, as, as a part of sort of a diverse housing strategy, we are seeing the need for more dwelling units like these. The biggest thing I noticed in my research um, is that a lot of places actually don't allow for dwelling units of this size in their zoning ordinance. Pennsylvania is actually rated as fairly tiny house friendly by a lot of tiny house enthusiast websites. Um, cities like Philadelphia, Philadelphia are getting rid of minimum base floor area requirements for their dwelling units and places like Mount Joy Township, you know, are obviously welcoming communities like this. But those were, again, some of the biggest issues that I noticed. And I'm just going to do this here to show you more of this fact sheet, something I should have done before. All of these under the resources are links. So you can click on them and they will open in a new window like so there's one, there's another lovely tiny house. Okay, so I think that's gonna be it for me. Uh, our executive director, Steve, would like to say something. So I'm gonna pass it back over to him. Yeah, just real quick before I, I think I hand it to Ben uh, next. Before I do that, Alexa touched upon it a little bit. I just wanted to make sure every, all of these fact sheets follow basically the same format. So, you know, regardless of the topic, they will all start with some background introductory information. Uh, they will touch upon kind of pros and cons, or as you see here, benefits and drawbacks. And then all of them have the practical tips box. Um, and then the, the resource link and Alexa was just showing you how they, op they will open up in separate windows for you. And last but not least, because a lot of these topics relate very closely to other subjects that are covered in the toolkit. They all have this related toolkit fact sheet um, that'll take you to those other um, fact sheets. But um, so anyway, I just wanted to point that out to everybody as, as we walk through it. So with that, I'm gonna hand you over to Ben 
uh, to talk about some of the research topics that he was involved in. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I am Ben Warner. I am a regional planner here at Tri-County, and I'm going to be talking about e-bikes, e-scooters, and personal delivery devices. So start talking here. The first one is e-bikes and e-scooters. Uh, they are fairly new to the United States, but have been a wide variety and friendly in a lot of European and Asian countries to um, cost efficient, cost efficient and easier ways to get around in bigger cities. So there we go. An electric bike, um, very similar to human powered bicycles. Uh, differences include small electric motors that provides pedal assistance. So easier to get up and down hills. Uh, you can move quicker through and around the cities, uh, rechargeable battery and display control system to show your speed and battery life because they're operated by batteries, which means they will eventually run out of power. They are permitted to be powered by motor alone, which are known as full throttle e-bikes, or they can be assisted. So the person operating the bike can be pedaling while the motor is also in progress, which is known as pedal assist e-bikes. Also with e-scooters, they are powered by an electric motor as well. They just have a deck on the bottom that the operator will stand on and can go about very similar to e-bikes are just not pedaling. Uh, e-bikes are broken down into three different classes. Uh, first one is e-bikes where they are pedal assisted. And basically those are the human will be pedaling. And then if they need to kick in for um, assistance from the battery operated, they can. The second class of e-bikes are known as the throttle type of e-bikes, which these are the ones I feel like people want to be lazy where they can just use the throttle and they can just go. No pedaling is needed and they can go up to 20 mile an hour and just enjoy the ride. But again, if the battery runs out, they, they can pedal if they want. And then the third class of e-bikes are very similar to the first type except the only difference here is with class one, the top speed is 20 mile an hour. And with class three, the top speed is 28 mile an hour. So you can pedal on your own, but you can also use the throttle to turn on and go pretty fast. A few rules and regulations that people aren't very aware of, I found because e-bikes are very pretty new, is the motor has to be less than 750 watts and they must have fully functional pedals in order for it to be an e-bike. You can't, you see a lot of man-made e-bikes, I feel like, where people just put a motor on it and go. Those are not legal. Um, and e-bikes are currently only permitted on sidewalk, bike lanes, and in PA state parks and state forests. They are not permitted on the roadways, even though you, I feel like you see a lot of e-bikes on the roads. They are not allowed on the roads because they are do not have the federal requirements for lights or mirrors and cannot be registered through PennDOT as a vehicle. A few benefits of e-bikes, they help cut back on congestion in and around the city or within smaller municipalities, and they expand mobility options for residents within a community. So that is it for that one. Next, we will go to the personal delivery devices, which is also a fairly new topic. Um, personal delivery devices, also known as PDDs, are a new form of ground-based ground delivery that is manufactured for transporting cargo and goods from one place to another that helps with contactless delivery. They are operated by a driving system that allows for auto autonomous or remote operations. Um, PDDs are actually classified as pedestrians by PennDOT and are offered the same rights as pedestrians are. They are permitted to operate in any pedestrian area, sidewalk, uh, crosswalk, safety zone, or pedestrian tunnel, and can operate on the side of the road on the shoulder that has a 25 mile per hour or less posted speed limit. They, the th two 
big things that they must obey is they must yield to the right of way of all pedestrians and pedocyclists in pedestrian areas, and they must travel in the same direction of traffic when traveling on a roadway shoulder or berm, which kind of makes sense. Um, there are two different types or two different phases of PDDs. The first one is where there's actually somebody operating it with insight within 30 feet of the PDD, you'll see somebody operating it with a handheld device. And that happens for no less than 90 days, but does not exceed 180 days. And then phase two is a little bit, could be more concerning where it is being remotely controlled from a farther distance. Basically, they'll just go out and somebody will be sitting somewhere controlling it much farther than 30 feet away from them. How are these regulated? So PennDOT is responsible for authorizing and developing policies governing the operations of PDDs, but municipalities are able to enforce any law, rule, or regulation as it relates to the operations of the PDD. So they can permit the use of PDD on any roadway within the jurisdiction of the municipality, or they can prohibit the use of PDD on any roadway as they please. Uh, again, a benefit of this is it allows for contact, contactless delivery and it can reduce congestion on roadways because you will have less delivery vehicles out on the road and could help or drawbacks or risk of accidents with PDDs. Obviously, if they're being remote controlled, there can be human error, which can cause many unsafe hazards. And the big thing that a lot of places suggested was develop a safety plan in case of emergencies so you are aware of what to do in case a PDD is involved with an accident. Next, I'll turn it over to Andrew. Thanks, Ben. Uh, my name is Andrew Bomberger. I'm a transportation planner here at Tri-County. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, about all street parking management and then our complete streets page, uh, pages of the toolkit. So the transportation topics. Uh, all street parking and management. So I think everybody is familiar with all of the issues of oversized, um, overbuilt parking lots, uh, typically driven by minimum parking standards. They're often dated by what we would consider outdated or even flawed guidance, uh, typically in the form of unnecessarily high ratios of parking space to floor areas, often designed to accommodate parking on the busiest day or two of the year. Uh, these large parking lots negatively impact development density, viability of walking, biking, or transit. Uh, they can exacerbate stormwater management issues and, and a host of other environmental issues and can just kind of simply be uh, unappealing aesthetically. So in 2017 and 2018, Tri-County uh, worked with uh, actually Shippensburg University and Tuscaloosa Township to undertake a study that looked um, looked at actual data of parking lot usage using drone and aerial drone photography uh, to analyze how much parking was being used uh, on even the busiest days of the year, uh, Black Friday, uh, you know, the Friday after Thanksgiving. Um, we actually have a, you can see on the, on the, um, on the toolkit, this this research was presented at the at the APA conference two years ago, I believe. Um, and th this this is the the PowerPoint presentation that was presented during it, and gives some of uh, some overview of uh, of the background of it, and then some examples of of uh, of what we found. Uh, but in general, the data showed the data showed approximately forty five percent parking uh, occupancy uh, on a typical day. And then on those peaks during uh, Black Friday, it approached 80%, but none of, none of them were, were exceeding 80%. So even on the busiest days of the year, parking lots were almost 20, almost 25% unused. Uh, so 
a big part of, of this toolkit, uh, the fact sheet, is, is uh, we're kind of suggesting to develop maximum parking standards based on the data we've collected of actual of how much parking lots are actually used and, and and the demand that we see instead of the minimums that are typically on the books. Um, so our strata, and this will be included in the in the uh, model zoning ordinance. Uh, the we would base the the numbers on the on the maximums on what we saw in the actual study, but allow for more flexibility um, by by showing a documented need. Um, and when we say we mean actual documentation of, of, a, of an increased parking need over the maximum stated. And then that those increases would also be paired with additional improvements for stormwater management or green infrastructure to offset some of those negative impacts that we were discussing. Um, so uh, th there's some other, in the toolkit, there's some other uh, resources here to some local examples of other, I would say, innovative or non-traditional um, parking uh, ordinances. So uh, we'll talk about complete streets as well. Uh, Throughout, uh, I would say, all of our transportation planning efforts at Tri-County and HATS, uh, our goal is to provide a transportation system that accommodates uh, and improves the safety and convenience of all users, all modes, all ages and abilities. And the toolkit actually has several, uh, several articles and, and fact sheets that, that kind of facilitate this. Complete streets. This is almost at this point kind of like a name brand for this goal. Uh, lots of communities have adopted um, have adopted policies, whether it, you know it's municipalities, counties, states, even some DOTs, state DOTs have have uh, have adopted complete streets policies. Those policies can take many different forms. Some of them are simple resolutions. Some of them are are much more strict. Uh, um, ordinances and things in their in their subdivision and land development. Uh, one of the great things about it being kind of a name brand, um, a, a name brand policy almost is the amount of guidance that's available out there. Uh, we link to a lot of them in the toolkit here um, at, at the county MPO state level. Uh, lots of great design resources. Um, so all of those can kind of help towards that goal of, of providing all, providing transportation for all users and all abilities and all ages. Uh, and I think this this topic is a good is a good uh, one to kind of illustrate another thing in the toolkit. We talked about the related the related um, toolkit fact sheets. You can see here the traffic calming. So we also have a a fact sheet on traffic calming. This is much more of an engineering based approach to a lot of the same things. Um, really, the goal of traffic calming is typically to slow traffic and improve safety for all users uh, while increasing the transportation choices, uh, and especially for cyclists um, and also and also pedestrians. Uh, again, lots of um, resources and examples here. And then we also have one on walkability. This one's kind of geared specifically towards facilitating pedestrian movement, uh, what communities can do to make walking easier and safer, uh, how that improves quality of life for residents, visitors, and anyone else in the community. Um, so I think with that, I'm going to pass it off to Jerry Duke. Hello everyone, I'm Jerry Duke. I'm the Dauphin County Planning Coordinator. Um, appreciate the, uh, everyone joining on today and learning what we're doing. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a couple of the things that I have worked on, but also uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the subdivision uh, provisions, um, kind of, uh, and tie it kind of all together on what we're looking to uh, pull as part of this whole thing.
the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, the solar. It's down here, environmental topics, right? Is that so? Solar facility. I had some good jokes queued up, but I was told not using them. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I'll do them anyway. All right. It's a hot topic, and I hope to shed some light on it. How's that? So there we go. Well, this is a big topic. I, I kind of joke about it, but uh, in fact, I'm not reading my uh, uh, my cell phone here instead of presenting. But just got a, a flash notice here today that uh, from the Washington Post: Biden wants the sun to provide nearly half of the nation's electricity by 2050. So, um, where are they going to put it all? Uh, where is the solar facility going to happen? So. Um, a lot of the local communities are faced with how to handle the solar facilities. Um, in Pennsylvania, the, uh, they've kind of made a choice that uh, this is going to fall onto the uh, backs of the local municipalities. Uh, they're the ones who are going to be facing where these things are going to be located and how they're going to be laid out. We already in uh, Dauphin County have seen some of this excitement. Uh, particularly up in the northern Dauphin area, which is the more rural uh, area. Um, they have been uh, contacted, the property owners have been contacted by a lot of solar companies looking to uh, start leasing lands uh, in the 300 to 500 acres for solar farms. Uh, and they're offering quite a good uh, amount of money. Um, they're anywhere from $800 to uh, in some cases, a couple thousand dollars per acre per year. So we're talking some good, good, good amount of money. So uh, um, there are some uh, land use implications on this. Uh, we've also faced some uh, examples where uh, local schools have been looking for putting uh, uh, development uh, electrical uh, solar fields on, and how do they handle? How do local municipalities handle that? So. Um, in essence, uh, this is getting to be a very, very uh, um, large topic, a concerning topic. Most local municipalities do not have any ordinances that address this. And again, it's uh, uh, the way the state has lined themselves up, it's going to be uh, uh, kind of onto the uh, local municipalities. Um, in essence, there are three different types of solar uh, fields or solar capacity. One is uh, your typical uh, solar on the roofs uh, or for a very small amount that's uh, made and uh, used right on its on the site. Um, that this, that's called a distributed generation. The second is uh, a community solar. Uh, I won't talk too much about that, but because in Pennsylvania has decided not to allow that yet, but there would be say a warehouse who's in an industrial park puts it on their uh, their uh, roof and then decides to sell it around to all the neighboring uh, community or businesses. Again, Pennsylvania doesn't allow that. Many states do, and there's current legislation that may end up allowing that. And then the utility scale, uh, which is again, commonly referred to as uh, the solar farms. Uh, each one of these things uh, have their own um, land use to, um, implications and such that bring it about. There is a lot of uh, things that are being done in terms of uh, resources. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, because it's such a uh, interesting topic and a concerning topic, uh, particularly uh, Penn State is doing some things. Uh, their law, uh, through the uh, law school down in Dickinson uh, has, uh, they're collecting a lot of different ordinances and they're uh, examining how it all matches up and how they're going to be able to uh, have rational development tools. The, uh, it hasn't been done yet. There are some work that's out there, but the minute uh, that we have it available, we will, uh, we will have it uh, posted on here. But again, there's all these different things that are happening. These are all things as resources. And again, you know, this is our toolkit here kind of gives you the background. And I'll, I'll wrap all that up about the, kind of how we're going to be uh, talking about how you can use these things. Uh, the next one I want to talk a little bit about is uh, another topic that is 
getting to be a little bit, uh, um, a little is also uh, a lot in the, uh, the, the world of uh, uh, attention. Um, affordable and attainable housing. Uh, we're using the word affordable and attainable, uh, particularly trying to focus on the word attainable. Uh, affordable housing tends to have a negative connotation uh, because everyone, whenever you go to a meeting and someone says they're gonna be building affordable housing, uh, they all automatically come out and say they, they don't want it. There's a very large NIMBY uh, uh, perception with this. Uh, what we're trying to do here is, uh, this is in our topic on our tool, toolkit. We're not trying to necessarily uh, talk about one way to go, but we're trying to lay out what the different uh, issues are behind it. Uh, there are a thousand different ways you can uh, uh, go and, and attack this issue. Uh, but again, uh, what we wanna do in this, uh, the toolkit is kind of talk a little bit about it. We tell you how it's sort of defined in terms of cost burden. And you, again, you can see right here in this section here, we do talk a little bit about it. But again, it's a, it's a large topic that has a lot of different ways to go. And what we're trying to uh, talk about in here is to make it a little bit more positive um, and then also talk about the benefits, but then also give you some background on, on uh, what affordable housing and attainable housing is. Um, you know, there's, there's a number of places that are trying different approaches, uh, particularly uh, the approach is going to uh, talk about making more of a supply type of thing. Minneapolis and other cities uh, have been reducing the amount of single family residential zoning in order to uh, increase the supply. So again, we're, we're talking a little bit about that. Here. So again, those are the, kind of the, the topics here. I'm gonna switch now instead of talking details on it, but I kind of want to use this as an example of what we're, what we're thinking of using this toolkit for and how to, you, you can use it. Um, how we've designed these is that whenever you have a, a community or there's somebody wants to learn something, we, we put it into a two page or one page thing so you can get the basics behind it. So if a community, or if you're working with a municipality and you have a council member who says, um, I wanna know a little bit more about attainable housing, you can you go to this site, you can have it printed off and you can hand it, hand it to them. For those who are more associated with the details associated, there's gonna be more of these guidelines and things like that, which you can use to go and dig deeper. So again, what we're trying to do with these, this toolkit is to get you some information up front, get you some detailed information and then start getting you tools to go to the next step. To which that leads me to uh, what we're going to do here. Now, Steve, where are we? Which is what uh, we're going to be leading to uh, our model subdivision. Uh, for those of you who do know and have worked with us in the past, you know, Tri County in 2008 has developed a uh, uh, model subdivision ordinance. And the ordinance was. Uh, uh, to give communities the basic standard of what a, uh, an MPC approved subdivision ordinance would contain and what would be uh, associated with having a from the beginning to end uh, type of ordinance. Uh, it has served a number of communities very well. Uh, it has served uh, uh, you know, a lot of ones probably within, definitely we know within our region, but also uh, we understand from outside the area. Um, so what we're going to do for us uh, as, as part of this uh, whole thing, and we're working on this right now, and we hope to have it as mentioned earlier at the beginning in the next few months uh, when it's all complete, is a brand new subdivision ordinance, um, model ordinance everyone can, can use. Um, it's going to have different things included in this, this chart, it's just a simple chart. You're not gonna, there's no test on this afterwards, but it's basically uh, highlighting what we're looking at doing for, for later on. Uh, one of the key components that everybody has been working communities is this uh, provision about the uh, modification to the preliminary plan approval. 
Uh, almost everybody who's worked in the local municipalities here in Pennsylvania see the preliminary plan approval get uh, approved like that, a waiver for it. So what we're looking to do is to try and uh, modify that version, still stay within the MPC and have it so that there is a model out there that people can use so that we don't always constantly have that issue uh, of going forward real fast. Um, as Andrew indicated, there's the smart street standards and there's models out there. We created some things on our own. We're going to load those in there. Um, and also too, uh, we hadn't really talked about it, but agricultural preservation. One of the things that we've learned with a lot of our working with our communities, particularly in the rural areas, is the concept of uh, trying to maintain farming and even open space. Uh, but they have a lot. A farmer has say 50 acres and they have three or four kids that they wanna sell one acre to. A lot of the things in our model ordinance doesn't allow is a, it's a 10 acre lot minimum. So if he has three kids and he's got a 50 acres, he's gonna slice off uh, three, 30, you know, 30 acres. And then that somehow may, may not make that uh, uh, farm viable anymore. Um, so uh, what, we're, what we've seen and working again with other townships in, in within Dauphin County is coming up with a concept for the uh, lot averaging or a sliding scale. Uh, particularly in the conservation and residential district, which will again be part of a, our, our thing. Um, as Alexa mentioned, uh, we are going to suggest that you take out the stormwater provisions from our code. Uh, we don't believe that uh, we've seen other communities who are, are want to be more flexible with the ordinance uh, within a subdivision ordinance. Uh, if you have it in there, it's going to uh, uh, maybe not give you the flexibility because you have to go through a number of procedures for uh, going through uh, um, the uh, development process and renewal process. Um, we will have we'll have this place somewhere where we'll keep our old one, but again, um, the uh, not having it uh, there is uh, what we're recommending. Um, I think another thing too is uh, similar to that is the filing fees. Uh, one of the things uh, our model ordinance has is if you uh, files for filing fees, then you know if every time you go need to change, they're going from a twenty dollar to twenty five dollar permit. You have to go through the subdivision process. There are ways to get around that to make it easier. And then um, you know again the coordination with procedures for modification. But again, it should, it'll be pretty much the same philosophy. It'll have exhibits have appendices with different development agreement, things like that, and they'll be modified in order to try and meet up with, uh, with uh, the modern day standards. So um, again, it's all part of this whole process, which we're trying to tie together with the, uh, we're doing this research, we're trying to pull it all together, and then we're gonna match it up to uh, uh, the new subdivision and with the zoning regulations. So uh, that, I think I am going to turn over to Jason Kennedy, and Jason is going to talk a little bit about the zoning requirements. Thank you, Jerry. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us uh, for this initial rollout of Tri County's updated uh, planning toolkit. Uh, it's my pleasure at this time to share some information dealing with the changes that are going to uh, be proposed for the uh, Regional Planning Commission's model zoning ordinance. Um, this revision, I guess, the revisit to the uh, model uh, zoning ordinance looks to update the current ordinance model by restructuring its overall layout incorporating uh, land use considerations observed since the original model ordinance was developed, together with um, other minor edits, such as spelling and typographical corrections that we did observe in the review process. So, um, restructuring of the, um, the model, uh, looks at the, um, the overall content, which as you can see here, those um, articles that are contained in the, the model presently are in white. Um, the only change is going to be the addition of an appendices at the tail end. 
Um, the format is going to structurally stay the same. We know that a lot of the municipalities in our region have used this format and um, will probably continue to do so. So uh, rather than change anything dramatically, it was thought best that we just kind of keep things uh, laid out basically the same way. Um, what I can tell you though, with the, um, the changes that are being looked at um, with the layout is the inclusion with the appendices of, of four principal um, elements that are going to be added. Um, one is actually being relocated from the designation of the, the zoning districts, and that is the use table. So we can talk, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But um, in terms of the, the content and the, of uses that we have seen, you know, changes to uh, or new uses that actually kind of emerge on the forefront of uh, conversation. Um, we're talking about accessory dwelling units, um, casinos, domestic keeping of farm animals, off-track bedding parlors, mini casinos even, um, outdoor cafes. We've seen a lot of that for the COVID here recently. Um, Short-term rentals, and then tiny homes, as, as was explained earlier, uh, just to name a few. Um, I think a lot of the, um, the topics uh, or the uses that we've been uh, adding to the, the model um, were talked about items at last year's uh, PPA conference. And um, we brought some of that information back and, and we're trying to plug it into this model. So. The, um, the primary districts are going to uh, remain as agriculture, conservation, forest, commercial, industrial, residential, and village mixed use. Um, they're gonna stay uh, contained under the, uh, the, the reference as primary districts. And if anyone can recall the, the old model or the one that you, you actually can go to still to this day up on our website, um, you had what we're going to consider um, optional district plugins. And that's to separate your residential district into other types of residential districts uh, or uh, reflecting densities primarily. The, um, the ordinance then goes into uh, separating um, neighborhood commercial from highway, which it's often referenced to uh, rather than the old C1, C2 arrangement. And then light and heavy industrial as opposed to the old I1, I2 uh, structure. So um, the, the institutional district was in the old ordinance um, and that's uh, still going to remain. The, um, the overlays, were kind of thrown around the ordinance. Uh, they weren't, there wasn't any real um, identifiable structure. So I thought that we would kind of capture and encapsulate them all in uh, kind of a plug-in arrangement as well. So um, you're gonna notice here too, that we had some kind of separate standalone ordinances up on our website presently that we're trying to plug some of those into the overlay feature. So, um, they're all listed there and I don't need to really go through them all individually, but uh, the appendix, um, this is where the use table has been relocated to. Uh, it's going to be looking at um, all of the um, districts that were referenced um, both um, as primary and plugins. So, um, that's been added to the appendices. We didn't feel like it needed to occupy space in the main text. Uh, it's probably a better place to kind of go looking for something like that. Um, and it will be by reference uh, listed within the, the main text of the, um, of, of the ordinance. So uh, there's also a zoning permit application placed in here, uh, as well as the, the variance request form and um, registrating um, the registration for non-conforming building structures or uses. Um, 
thought about some other things dealing with some checklists that we might plug in here. Um, we're still continuing to take on comments and we're trying to get both models up and posted, I guess, in advance of our PPA conference this year. So and that, I guess that holds true for all of the um, fact sheets as well. So um, and with that, I think that brings me pretty much to the end of my presentation. Um, we'll obviously work to continue with any additional land uses you know, offered by um, municipalities or public. Um, we'll, we'll be working with, with the information that um, uh, Andrew had mentioned regarding uh, parking maximums. We're gonna be trying to plug that in here shortly. Um, we anticipate uh, that we'll have it done probably by next month. So um, we feel that the local officials and the um, model zoning ordinance would be most helpful when preparing or amending zoning ordinances, or the subdivision and land development ordinance. Um, and also, you know, we hope it, uh, they all fit your local community needs. So um, as with any, um, as with the current formatted ordinance, uh, public officials are cautioned, you know, that they should seek uh, competent legal counsel um, when they're, preparing the amendments or, or even a new ordinance. Um, obviously, we, we definitely want them to incorporate uh, the thoughts and ideas of, of their solicitor, um, as well as their municipal engineer, um, zoning officials, if you have one. Um, so I guess now I would just turn it back over to Steve um, for any final thoughts and uh, I look forward to hearing your any comments that you have? Thanks, Jason. Um, and maybe while I'm still on this, uh, you know, some of his slides for zoning, um, one of the things that with with either of them or any of the model ordinances that we plan on putting here, one of the one of the things that we recognize is. You know, some people might just be interested in updating their definitions um, or a particular district uh, that they have taking a fresh look at it, that kind of thing. So when we have this finalized over the next month or so um, and post it to the toolkit, it'll be in an Adobe format, which is, you know, not that easy, obviously, to just uh, do your own thing with. But um we do, we do realize we're gonna do it in a way that it's what I would call modular, um, meaning that you don't have to take the whole thing, you can take any part of it. And the way to do that, uh, if you take a look at the, the PDF that you're gonna have available to the toolkit, is to touch base with us, uh, you know, whoever from our staff you're used to dealing with um, can work with you and get you an editable version of the particular section of an ordinance that you're most interested in updating. Or if you're going to take the whole, you know, if you haven't had zoning and you're going to do it, we would offer to work with you uh, to get you something that, that as Jason was indicating, um, you know, matches your comprehensive plan and, and that you can um, work forward with. So just to give you an idea, and getting back to the broad toolkit itself, um, as was indicated a couple of times, and I think you now have a feel for it. We're not quite done. We're getting close to done. Um, I think one thing that I'll probably ask uh, Larry Portsline to do, and I think he already sent out um, the link to the survey, um, but maybe we provide a, a link to this website to give you a chance to take a look at what fact sheets we do have. I'd say probably 90% of them are done and, and already preloaded here. Um, but we're obviously, as we try to finalize this overall website and resource page for you, um, you know, we're still open to any comment that you might have, any questions that you might have as we make refinements um, through the rest of the year. Because I think that's our goal is to have this thing fully functional by the end of the year. And then as Lauren indicated uh, at the beginning, you'll have this ability 
within the toolkit to either offer comment on any of the fact sheets or the content in there, suggest new topics. Because I think one goal that we have in mind, rather than um, the situation that we had previously where we pulled together some things, put it under a toolkit, and then didn't touch it for a number of years, we'd like to keep this as current as we can uh, and uh, you know, include those new topics like Ben was reviewing with the e-bikes uh, and that kind of thing. Some of the new things that you're seeing, we'd appreciate uh, if you could reach out to us through this uh, part of our website um, and identify those topics for us you know, and or offer any comments. If you're using a, a fact sheet and you see new uh, guidance out there, if you come across something that you think would be helpful to others, reach out to us and let us incorporate that into the fact sheet so we can uh, keep the information flowing. So with that, I am going to basically um, conclude. I don't see that anyone typed in any uh, questions during the, during the chat or during the session itself. So at this point, I would offer the opportunity of anybody who's, who's in wants to make a comment or ask a question, um, feel free at this point to unmute yourself. Uh, we'll recognize you and, and you can make that comment or ask your question. Hey, Steve, it's Michelle Brummer. Yes, Michelle. So one thing I wonder about is something along the lines of, okay, economic analysis isn't really represented here among these topics. And it's not necessarily like at the core of what you as an agency do, but it can really inform zoning and, you know, sort of other types of tools that a municipality might need. Um, have you considered any guidance or maybe it's somewhere not in the toolkit about like what levels of economic analysis are appropriate and how should a municipality begin to think about that if they want to include it as an element in a comprehensive plan or do it as a standalone for something, that might be a, a topic to provide some, at least a little bit of general information on, unless you've covered it elsewhere. Just a thought. Yeah. No, there, there's, there are elements of the toolkit that touch upon that. You'll see brownfield redevelopment, a few, mm -hmm. a few other things, but not really if you're talking about the component, for instance, of a comprehensive plan. Um, so, but that's, that, that's an example, Michelle, of something that, um, you know, back a year ago when we started this process and, and reached out to folks and asked them to help us identify topics that they thought would be uh, good additions to this, that is not one that came up. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a, that's a good example of something that, you know, once we make sure we have that, uh, interested in a topic not listed functional, um, you know, if you want to submit that um, and we can coordinate and see if that's a uh, something we want to add to the toolkit, we'd certainly uh, consider that. So appreciate that input. Sure. Oh, I'm seeing something came into the, oh, there's Larry shared the uh, the link to what we're looking at right now in the in the chat box. So appreciate that, Larry. That was very helpful. So uh, again, when you get in there, you'll see um, if the, if a uh, topic hasn't been completed and uploaded yet, you won't get a link to a fact sheet. But I think uh, the vast majority of them are posted there. So any input that anybody has. I think we touched upon maybe a little less than half of all the topics that are in the toolkit today. So there's a lot of poking around that anybody could do um, and offer comment. We would very much appreciate that as we try to get this thing done by the end of the year. So thanks, Larry. Any other comments, questions um, from any of the participants? quiet group. All right, uh, not hearing anything. We did just uh, 
past the one hour um, time slot. So uh, again, Larry, for, if you're gonna claim that uh, CM credit uh, for your AICP, uh, he did provide you with the information that, that you need there. So um, we appreciate you participating today. Uh, and we look forward to hearing any input that you might have on, on any of the topics either that we discussed today or didn't get a chance to. Um, we appreciate um, you being a part of this process with us. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody here for being part of the presentation. Hope you found it uh, worthwhile. Oh, wait a minute. Something else is popping up in the chat. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so anyway, thanks again, everybody. Um, and, and please uh, poke around when you get a chance um, with this draft toolkit thus far. If you have any particular expertise in a particular topic or you have a resource that you think would be a good addition, great input, uh, very helpful for us. So thank you very much. We appreciate everybody participating today. We'll see you later.